Yeah, welcome, welcome back to my show. My name is Mikey. You guys rocking with me on Mikey's Intellectual Corner. On today's episode, we're going to be diving back into our epic history TV. This is World War One, 1916. Boys, we're just going to go dive right into it. Let's go. <laughs> World War I was supposed to have been a short and glorious war. But by 1916, a new kind of industrialized warfare had seen the death toll soar into the millions, with no end in sight. Mind you guys, this is t just two years into it and we're already death toll into the millions. Which is just, you know what I'm saying, that's just ridiculous to think about, already into the millions. I think Austria-Hungary Austria already has two million themselves dead. Or into the millions, with no end in sight. Naval blockades were beginning to cause shortages of food and fuel across Europe. While thousands of women had entered the workforce, replacing the men sent to fight in their millions. All sides were preparing for a long war. The war has raged for a year and a half as the Allies continue to battle the Central Powers, recently joined by Bulgaria. At sea, the British maintain their naval blockade of Germany, preventing the import of food and other vital raw materials. Germany has retaliated with a U-boat blockade of Britain, but has to limit its attacks to avoid provoking the neutral USA, whose citizens have already been caught in the crossfire. Which, in my opinion, I don't understand why the USA just didn't put a restriction on going anywhere near the freaking Europe. I mean, I understand there's a whole bunch of immigrants and stuff like that, but at this time, but at the same time, it's like, come on guys, there's a literal war going on over there where already millions are dead. Do you think it's a really good idea to go over there for a vacation or something, you know? To limit its attacks, to avoid provoking the neutral USA, whose citizens have already been caught in the crossfire. On the Western Front, French, British and Belgian troops are dug in opposite the Germans, both sides trapped in the bloody stalemate of trench warfare. On the Eastern Front, the Russians have ended their long retreat and stabilized the line, but their army has suffered huge losses. On the Italian Front, Italian troops have launched a series of costly, unsuccessful attacks against strong Austro-Hungarian defenses. While on the Balkan Front, the Central Powers have overrun Serbia, whose army is forced to make a bitter retreat we also learned through this that they that freaking Serbia ends up losing like six but sixteen percent of their entire population, which we learn is the the of the largest of you know any nation at this time, or through I think at period um, uh, in World War One anyway. Bitter retreat through the Albanian mountains. Now on the fifth of January. Austro-Hungarian troops attack Montenegro. They are delayed at the Battle of Mojkovac, but three weeks later, Montenegro is forced to surrender. On the Caucasus front, the Russians launch a surprise winter offensive against Ottoman Turkish forces. Six weeks later, Russian troops occupy the city of Erzurum. In April, they capture the Black Sea port of Trebizond. Meanwhile, the British transport two motorboats. Yeah, you can tell the Ottoman Empire really was not ready for this war. Or you can tell they really didn't want to be in this war as much as the other intra powers, in my opinion. Maybe, maybe not, but in my opinion, I don't think that they did. Just for the fact that, one, half of them didn't want to in the first place, and half of them had to go and freaking bomb stuff on all of them. Yeah, like motorboats to Lake Tanganyika in Africa. They finally arrive after a 10,000 mile trip by sea and land, 
and help the British seize control of the strategic lake from local German forces. The same month, in German Cameroon, German troops besieged on Mora Mountain for 18 months finally surrender to the Allies. It marks the end of the Cameroon campaign. On the Western Front, the Germans unleash a devastating assault on the French fortress town of Verdun. German General Erich von Falkenhayn knows France will defend this symbolic town to the last man. His and real quick too, can we just like appreciate this picture that was taken over like a hundred years ago? Uh, and you know, shows perfect motion. I'm just saying real quick. But, and also, yeah, as we were about to find out, Verdun was France's uh, most catastrophic battle in World War One. Let's see what happens. Last man. His plan, in his own words, is to bleed France white in its defense. It is the strategy of attrition. Verdun becomes one of the most terrifying battles of the war. A mincing machine where infantry divisions are destroyed almost as fast as they can be fed into the line. In Britain, one million men have already volunteered for military service. But the government realises it won't be enough. Britain becomes the last major power to introduce conscription. That spring, on the Western Front, British troops are the last to be issued with steel helmets. The nature of trench warfare produces a high proportion of head wounds. The German Stahlhelm, the French Adrian helmet, and the British Mark I steel helmet offer limited protection from shell splinters and shrapnel. Neutral Portugal has been cooperating with the British, which seems to offer the best chance of holding on to her African colony, Portuguese Angola. On the 9th of March, Germany retaliates by declaring war on Portugal. On the Eastern Front, Russia launches an attack near Lake Narok to relieve pressure on the French at Verdun. But it's a disaster. There are 100,000. Yeah, we can definitely see the, uh, the end is near for the Russian Empire at this point because so many of their battles have just ended in like whole armies worth of like casualties in which one calls this ridiculous if you can think about it. There are 100,000 Russian casualties and the attack fails to divert any German troops from the fighting at Verdun. In Dublin, Irish Republicans launch an armed revolt against British rule. It becomes known as the Easter Rising and is put down after six days of street fighting. In the Middle East, after a five-month siege, British forces at Kut surrender. General Townsend leads 9,000 British and Indian soldiers into captivity. About half later die from starvation or disease. Britain wants Arab support in its fight against the Ottoman Empire. So it's promised Arab leaders an independent Arab state after the war. The backhanded promise that obviously they don't get. Secretly sign the Sykes-Picot Agreement, planning after the war to divide the Middle East into British and French zones of control. Unaware of this deal, Hussein bin Ali, Sharif of Mecca, leads the Arabs in revolt against Turkish Ottoman rule. In the Battle of Mecca, his forces seize control of the Holy City. On the Italian front, Austro-Hungarian forces launch a surprise attack at Asiago. Italian defences give way. Austro-Hungarian troops are poised to break through into northern Italy. That month in the North Sea, the German High Seas Fleet clashes with the British Grand Fleet at the Battle of Jutland. 
In the only major naval battle of the war, the British suffer heavier losses, but claim victory as the German fleet withdraws and does not re-emerge from its base for the rest of the war. For the summer of 1916, the Allies have planned major, simultaneous offensives against the Central Powers, from East and West. Now they are needed more than ever to relieve pressure on the French at Verdun and the Italians at Asiago. The Russians launch their attack first. On the Eastern Front, General Alexei Brusilov has carefully maintained the element of surprise. His troops break through the enemy lines, in some places advancing 60 miles and taking 200,000 prisoners. This brilliant, though costly, Russian attack achieves its aim, as the Central Powers are forced to redeploy troops from other fronts to shore up the line. At sea... Which also makes me wonder, like, was it really that smart of an idea, you know, um, declaring war on Portugal when now we're having to, we're already, one, we're already on a multiple, not even just two, just multiple freaking front war. And, you know what I'm saying, we're already, uh, just probably didn't seem like the best move. Oh. British cruiser HMS Hampshire, en route to Russia, hits a mine and sinks off Orkney. Among the 650 dead is Britain's iconic Secretary of State for War, Lord Kitchener. Three days later in the Adriatic, Italian troop ship Principe Umberto is sunk by a German submarine. It's the deadliest sinking of the war, with 1,900 lives lost. On the Western Front, Britain and France launched their major summer offensive, the Battle of the Somme. Hopes are high for a breakthrough, but the first day is a disaster. A long Allied artillery bombardment fails to knock out German defences, and waves of British infantry are cut down by machine gun fire as they advance into no man's land. In the space of a few hours, the British suffer 57,000 casualties, a third of them killed. It's the worst day in the history of the British Army. Yeah, think about it, that's like 60,000, that's like 10,000 dead every like freaking hours. That's like freaking, like you know what I'm saying? At some point, these freaking officers had to know themselves or had to say to themselves, like, we're just feeding meat grinder at this point. You know what I'm saying? Like, you, you imagine seeing like 10,000, somebody, 10,000 people dying right before your eye in an hour, and then it repeats itself for several freaking hours. It's the worst day in the history of the British Army. But more attacks are ordered, and the battle will rage for another five months. Encouraged by the Russian advance, Romania joins the Allies. But despite an initially successful advance into Transylvania, Romania quickly faces a counter-offensive from German, Bulgarian and Austro-Hungarian forces. The Allied force at Salonika tries to support Romania by launching their own offensive towards Monastir. With Serbian troops in the lead, there are small gains but dogged Bulgarian resistance prevents a breakthrough. On the Western Front, General von Falkenhayn finally calls off the attack at Verdun. The French army has honoured their commander, General Nivelle's promise. Ils ne passeront pas. They shall not pass. But victory comes at a terrible price. 365,000 casualties. The Germans lose almost as many. Verdun remains one of the bloodiest battles in human history. Yeah, I mean, pretty much freaking two entire whole armies died on that freaking battlefield, you know what I'm saying? That's just ridiculous. It almost makes you kind of wonder, like, what well, must have been going through these men's minds to just want to keep going after seeing 
this much destruction, this much chaos, this much dead bodies, all that, you know? It's one of the bloodiest battles in human history. For his defeat at Verdun, Falkenhayn is sacked, and Germany's heroes of the Eastern Front, von Hindenburg and Ludendorff, take command in the West. Meanwhile, the Battle of the Somme continues. Near the village of Fleur, the British introduce a new weapon they hope can break the deadlock of the trenches. It is called the tank. But despite some small successes, the first tanks are too few in number and too prone to mechanical failure to make any real impact. Yeah, but still, can you imagine that as a freaking early 19th or early 20th century freaking, uh, you know, German soldier? That shit must have been looking real scary coming at you, looking like a monster coming at you, a freaking trench. Yeah, no. Impact. On the Eastern Front, Russia's Brusilov offensive comes to an end. Casualty estimates vary wildly, but it's clear both sides have suffered catastrophic losses. Neither the Russian nor the Austro-Hungarian army ever fully recovers. On the Italian Front, heavy fighting rages throughout the autumn. As Italian forces make repeated, costly assaults against Austro-Hungarian positions along the Isonzo River. The Battle of the Somme comes to an end amid autumn rain and mud. The Allies have advanced 10 miles at the cost of 600,000 casualties. German losses are about 450,000. The Allies reassure themselves that this is a winning strategy, because at this rate, Germany will run out of men first. Kind of crazy that they just kind of admitted to deliberately throwing men into to their deaths, essentially, you know, throwing men into the meat grinder as a way to win. Because after this, I'm pretty sure like a lot of older uh, British men would end up having like that war guilt, having to throw all these young men into this, like like I said, the meat grinder, because they know that they're going to die, and it's crazy to think about. But... Because at this rate, Germany will run out of men first. Meanwhile, disaster engulfs Romania, as the country is overrun by the Central Powers. Romanian forces suffer a quarter of a million casualties. The remnants of its army take position alongside the Russians on the Eastern Front. That winter, Franz Joseph, Emperor of Austria since 1848, dies. He is succeeded by his son. Which is really crazy thing about, like, can you just imagine, like, he, his mind is just stuck in World War One. you know what I'm saying? He doesn't know what happened, any of that, because that's what he passed away, and that's just crazy to think about. Obviously, we're millions of people into it, but, you know what I'm saying? It's just him as an emperor, I guess. You know? 1848 dies. He is succeeded by his son, Carl. In Britain, Prime Minister Herbert Asquith is forced from office and succeeded by David Lloyd George, while General Joffre is replaced as French Commander-in-Chief by General Nivelle, who promises victory through bold, aggressive action. Amid the comings and goings, US President Woodrow Wilson's attempts to mediate a peace settlement come to nothing. Neither side is willing to make concessions. Alright guys, we'll go ahead and end it right there. Yeah, I think that is like, this is why I, I always like, I got so interested in whenever I went over to Europe, just thinking to myself like, dang, what's the point of time, you know what I'm saying, World War is just raging right here, you know what I'm saying, I'm standing where the Austria, Austria Hungary used to be, and you know, just crazy stuff like that. But anyway, I, thank you guys again for joining me on another episode of Mike's Intellectual Corner, I'll see you guys on another one, I'm out, peace.